Excellent. Okay, folks, let's kick off. And so it's lovely to see you here today for the sixth week of OLS 5. Um, so our usual reminders, I'll go through quite quickly, just looking at my other screen on the side. Um, OLS has a code of conduct, treat one another with the respect that you'd like to receive. Um, and if at any point you believe you have either witnessed or experienced anything that isn't in line with our code of conduct, then you can report it to myself, Berenice, um, Malvika, or Emmy. The email addresses to do so is lines 136 and 137 right now. That may change a bit as people add things into the notes though. Um, we have a transcript for the call so that you can follow along. Um, on my screen, there is a live at Otter AI on the top left of the screen. If you click on that, then you can click on view script stream on Otter AI. And that will just record everything that we're saying and it converts it into text as well, which can help you follow along the call. Um, and finally, when we do breakout rooms, we will have one breakout room in this call. We offer the choice of having a spoken breakout room or a written breakout room, depending on what, what works better for you. Um, and so the way that we sort people into those breakout rooms is by asking people to edit their names in Zoom um, and adding a W in front of your name if you prefer written or S in front of your name if you prefer spoken. Um, so I do that um, in my participants window, I find my name and then I actually click on the more button and I click on rename and then I can add W in front of my name. So I'll just ask if everyone else could do that, that would be really convenient. I'm just going to mute for a moment while everyone has a go. Okay, and it looks like most of you have done that. So thank you very much, folks. Um, if you're having any trouble doing it, we will ping you in the background and just make sure that we know what room, what type of room you'd prefer when you're participating. Um, if I missed anything, I've got shakes of heads, so I'm going to assume we're good. In that case, Festus, do you want to introduce the next bits? Yeah, sure. Welcome. So today we'll be looking at the, using the project management skills during the development stage. And in open science, I think there are many aspects which, we, which are there to cover. But in this call, we'll be looking at the open source software, and then we'll be looking at the open data sharing, the such outputs which you get from your study. And then we'll also be looking at the open source hardware, how to get the affordable and maintainable equipment for your project. So that, without taking much time, I'd like to welcome Lily Winfrey to talk about the man managing and developing research data. Lily Winfrey, take the stage, it, it is yours, and introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Festus. Hi, everyone. I'm Lily, and I'm the product manager of the open source project Frictionless Data at the Open Knowledge Foundation. And I am based in Austin, Texas, so it is still barely morning for me. So good morning to everyone. And I am going to share my screen so that I can show you my slides. And I've also linked the slides in the note stock. So please go ahead and take a look at those if you would like. Um, can I share my screen? Hold on. All right, can everyone see my screen? Cool, okay, I'll well, put it in present mode. It's loading on my end. All right, good. Okay. <laughs> you, I could just see your fingers waving. <laughs> All right. So I'm here to talk to you all about open data in the life sciences. I'm really excited to talk to you about this. I've been working in open data for years, and I think that it's a really important part of working openly. And you can also put questions in the notes doc if you have questions while we're going over this. Okay, so what is open data? This is the definition from the Open Knowledge Foundation, which is where I work. Open data and content can be freely used, modified and shared by anyone for any purpose. So what I want you to see in this is that this definition shows us how it can be used, including modified and shared, 
who can do it, and in this case, it's anyone, and then what the reason is for, so any purpose. So this is basically anyone can do anything that they want. And today we are going to talk about open data in a few different ways. So we'll talk about what I like to call good enough open data, fair data, data licensing, DMP or data management plan, and publishing your data. And I'm only talking for a few minutes, so I'll just hit briefly on each of these things. This is what I call good enough data or the five stars of open data, where even one star is better than zero stars. So here in this um, table, you can see one star of open data being like the least open, but still good, and with five stars being the most open. So one star is where you make your data available on the internet under an open license. So this allows other people to find it and use it, which is great. The next level up is that you make that open data structured. So an example of this is using a Excel document instead of like a PDF so that you can access the information inside of it. Then the next level would be to make your data available in a non-proprietary format. So you would use a CSV file instead of an Excel file. For CSV is a comma separated value file that anyone can access with any program, as opposed to like, if it's an Excel file, you have to have Excel. The next step, stage up is to use URIs to denote things. And this gets a little bit more technically complicated, but basically it means make your data persist, make it available for other people to find. And then finally, the best of the best open data is when you make it more linkable. So this is when you have linked data, which maybe you've heard about linked data before, but this uses schemas. So say like I have a data set and Yo has a data set and we use the same schemas or standards and then we could combine our data sets together. And so we've made our data more powerful in that sense. But the main thing I want you to take away from this slide is like at least pushing, publishing your data online and openly is awesome. Okay, why do you want open data? So this makes your data FAIR. Maybe you've heard of FAIR before. It's an acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And these are principles that many scientists strive to achieve with their data. And they also hit these five stars pretty well as well. So for data to be really usable, it should be findable, should be accessible, which means that it shouldn't be behind a paywall, for instance. It should be interoperable. Like if I gave my data set to Yo, she'd be able to use it and reusable. So like if I gave my data set to, let's see, I'll pick on Callum because I can see Callum's name too. Callum should be able to open my data set and just immediately understand what's inside of it. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but here's two links if you wanna look into FAIR principles in more detail. Okay, so now hopefully I've convinced you why you should use open data, but how do you do it? The first thing you need to think about when you're creating data is to think about data licensing. And I want you to research your options. So when you're thinking about licensing your data, you need to think, what do you want to do with the data? Do you want other people to be able to distribute the data, use it, create something new? Who do you want to be able to use the data? Anyone or like only non-commercial entities? And then do you want to be attributed for that data? Like if I gave my data to Callum, do I want Callum to have to say like, I got this data from Lily? These are just questions for you to think about. And then here's one example of a data license. This is called CC by 4.0. This is a Creative Commons license. And this is the text of that license, which is, I'll read it. This license lets others distribute, remix, tweak, and build upon your work even commercially, as long as they credit you for the original creation. So again, this talks about what people can do, who can do it, and if there's any limitations. I'm giving you some resources that you can look at on your own time about data licensing, Creative Commons, the open definition, um, and then two other data licenses that are pretty good. Okay, moving on. 
Next thing we're going to talk about is data management plans. And this is kind of like project planning for your data, which I think we'll talk more about project planning in a few more talks. Um, but I like to think about this as project planning for data. So when you're starting an experiment or accessing someone else's data, these are questions you need to think about. How are you collecting this data? What type of data are you collecting? Are there any ethical or privacy concerns with your data? Is the data in a proprietary format? How will you release the data? How long will you maintain or host the data? What's the license? And how can you make that data fair? These are a lot of things to think about. So I've left you some resources that you can look at. The first is 10 simple rules for creating a good data management plan. And the second is this nice tool called DMP Online. And that will help you like walk through step-by-step step and make a data management plan. Data management plans are really important for making sure that you don't forget something important when you're working with data. And they're super helpful for ethical or privacy concerns, which are very important when you're working with data. Okay, next thing we talk about is publishing your data, which I like, call, I like to call making your data actually useful because like, if I have a data set and I do all of these things, you know, have the license, et cetera, et cetera, but I just keep it to myself, then it's not as useful because no one else can access it. So next thing to do is to publish it. Um, an important step in publishing your data is to keep track of the metadata. And metadata is data about the data. So it's things like, what is the license? What are the names of the columns? And if you're measuring something, what are the units that you used? These are things that, again, if I had a data set and I was giving it to Callum, he would be able to access it and say, oh, I understand this data set is talking about how much rain was recorded in the month of May in Texas, because there will be inches, there will be location data, et cetera. It's all of that info about the data. Okay, when you publish, I also encourage you to use non-proprietary formats. So use a CSV file so anyone can open it. And also when you publish, publish your data in a repository. There are institutional repositories, like if you're at a university, um, or you can use an open repository. There's, here's two examples, Zenodo and Dryad, which are both great open repositories. You can also publish your data with a manuscript. If you are publishing a manuscript, many journals now allow you to do that. And I encourage you to publish in an open access journal, meaning anyone can access the information. Okay, I think that might be everything I have. Yes, thank you for listening. The more you know about open data. Um, and I could take questions about any of these things. I know. It's a lot of information and I went over it really quickly. Are there questions? Thank you can you stop sharing the, my screen. Thank you for the nice presentation. So there's a question on the chat from Laura. Do you like to unmute yourself to ask the question or should I ask on your behalf? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sis. Uh, hi, Lily. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great, great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And, and exactly what the R5 team uh, that it's here uh, um, with me uh, has, <laughs> are having to deal with. And it's uh, particularly, so my question for you was, um, do you have any pointer to how to share health data? from particularly health data from electronic health records don't worry nobody's sharing that yet <laughs> so yeah for those of you in the room who are freaking out as i speak no it's yeah yo, no yeah that, that's exactly my face when when people want to share this so uh no we are not sharing that but uh we are using uh electronic health uh records for research and we would like to, we are here uh, to do open science and research. And so we are even thinking about uh, having to synthesize data. Uh, 
uh, not even sharing. But you know, any pointers or any information, any links, anything that you can share with us uh, on that topic, it will be amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, first of all, great question, right? Like, it's such a good use case of showing kind of the, the two sides of sharing data, right? I think we all be really believe in sharing things openly, but it's super important to think about privacy concerns. You know, if we share medical data, like that's super private. Um, and I actually don't know that I have a good resource for you. Um, I'm wondering if anybody else does. I, I know that people think about this. I don't think about health data a lot. Um, yeah, I would say <laughs> asking on the OLS Slack group, which is where I get all of my help from. Um, but I do think it's important to talk about that a little bit more. Like, Laura, would you unmute and maybe share some of the reasons why it's why you're thinking about this as a learning experience for others? Yeah, sure. But I would also love to have the rest of the team uh like sabrina i know you're online i saw you and uh and i don't want to or well, maybe not uh I mean, we, we are five in our teams and all, all of the folks involved know and i know it seems like sabri had to log off for some reason okay um folks if you're in the room please jump in uh but otherwise um okay well you've said it <laughs> Uh, you know, how would you feel anyone in this room if your clinical record uh, would be shared uh, in any way, right? I mean, it's it's our health. We don't want anyone, you know, even if it's for the sake of uh, great research and advancing uh, the a better world for everyone. Uh, you know, I know I don't want that information from me online anywhere near anyone uh, other than the, the folks that are um, uh, that are involved in my care. So even if I consent for research and, and, and the consent for research is also something very important. So suppose I did consent uh, when I gave that data. Yeah, you can do with this data whatever you want. Even then, uh, I, you know, linking the person with this very highly sensitive data, it's problematic. And different countries have different, uh, you know, like in, in the US where I work with health data, you have HIPAA, uh, which is a, a, a legal <laughs> framework that protects data a lot, but mostly small data, not like the big data from <laughs> that you can amass in a, because you can identify folks. If you, if you start combining different data sets that are public, you can even identify folks. So it, it's a very iffy, complicated uh, thing when, you, when it comes to health uh, and, and, and it's in the way. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of folks working on this and I, I keep seeing the chat uh, active, so thank you. Um, but I, I don't think anyone has it solved. <laughs> internationally i mean and we are in argentina so it's, it's a, you know there's a few layers onto this so we, we, i'm coming with this question from the global uh south uh from a high middle income country so it's it could be uh, th there's uh, folks that have it a lot worse than us but even then uh, it's not as being in in, in a, a high income country so um i Callum, thank you. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, so um, at the uh, um, uh, the Turin, so I'm I'm a member of the research engineering group at the Turin, and we we are we are involved in a few different um, synthetic data projects, and I'm I'm involved in 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 one. And um, when I when I um, came to the project, I was very no, I mean, I'm, I still am very new to the area, so don't uh, you know take my word as uh, <laughs> absolute gold. But um, it it does seem that it's a problem that is largely unsolved because um, um, and it all comes down to the uh, uh, privacy you you a motility trade off, right? So if you if you're releasing a data set that you want 
someone to learn something from, then it needs to be close enough to the real data to be useful. But then the, that's like a paradox because if it's if it's useful and you learn something, then you're going to give hey, some, some privacy budget away. Um, hey, Carla. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think I maybe might have around the question. I think this discussion is really important, especially considering the privacy of health data. I think we can also continue the discussion in Slack, right? Yeah. But I am happy to continue that. So I think uh, um, Lily can take one question and then you can move on to the next session. So then the one question Lily can take is, what should, what should you do when someone uses your data in a way that violates your license? That's a great question and it's also complicated. So I'm gonna answer this from perspective of like a researcher in the United States at a university, which is when I was dealing with this type of question. Um, many universities have lawyers which deal with these things, which is kind of wild if you'd never thought about that before. Um, many universities technically own the intellectual property of the researchers, which can include the data. And so it's not just a problem for the researchers, like it becomes a legal problem for the university. And we could talk about the ethics of that another time. Um, so if you're, if you are like very concerned about someone else using your data for whatever reason, if you, it, you can get lawyers involved, like it, it is a legal document. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, this is kind of another argument for like using the most permissive license so that you don't have to do things like this, but then you do lose some control of how the data is used. Awesome, awesome. thank you. And maybe just to wrap it up, is there a specific criteria to apply the five-star method for different data types or maybe you just choose whatever box for your data type. Is there a criteria for applying the five star method? Sorry, Festus, I lost you for a second. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, so uh, somebody asked, is there a way to apply the five star method for the different data types? I mean, depending on the field that you are, there is a different data type. Is there a criteria for applying the five star method? Um, to answer that quickly, I would suggest that you look at that data management plan tool, because I think that has good resources for different data types. And I think it would hit all of those five stars. Uh, but I can answer more things in the chat if you want, or you can message me on Twitter as well. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. So we'll move on to the next session, which is managing and developing an open source software project. And this session is led by Andre Stewart. Welcome. Thanks very much, Festus. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. I'm going to start share. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, start sharing my screen. Uh, just move that up there. Uh, okay. Um, thanks very much. Um, my name is Andrew Stewart. Um, I'm the institutional lead for open and reproducible research at the University of Manchester here in the UK. Um, I'm from Northern Ireland, uh, so I'll be interested to see how the transcription goes with my accent. Um, you can follow me on GitHub or, or Twitter or email me. Um, I'm also a fellow of the SSI, um, and I'm the uh, one of the uh, uh, project leads on the UK RN, which is UK Reproducibility um, Network. Um, so I want to kind of cover three things really in this talk. Um, so it's all about how how you use open source in your own research, because you know one of the sort of um, sort of fundamental things we tend to do as researchers is we create tools that are actually built uh, on tools that others have created. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we make our own software open source, and and by software I should make it clear that I'm talking about any sort of research software that you might be developing as part of your research workflow. So it could be you know, uh, a script associated with data tidying, that would count as software, data visualization, statistical modeling, um, any sort of kind of uh, extraction of meaning for data would all come under the general uh, umbrella title uh, of software. And then importantly, um, how you recognize the open source contributions uh, of others, because obviously open source software, uh, you know, doesn't just magically appear. 
Um, it's the result of a lot of time and effort by you know, a global team of um, software developers, whether they're in academia or an in industry or sort of doing it on the side, uh, all basically uh, working together and collaborating. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, over the last decade or so, we've recognized that open source generally has really changed the way in which the world works when you think of sort of uh, you know, the impact of Linux uh, over the last couple of decades, Internet of Things, all of the great open source tools that kind of underlie the internet and all the different resources that we use in our um, in our everyday work. Um, but if we think about it in the context of research, well, yeah, I kind of think research software is where open source software maybe was 10 or 15 years ago with really the research landscape changing dramatically over the last few years. This is a, a tweet from... 2019, where a PhD student from a very good research lab, neuroscience lab, uh, was at the um, uh, sort of Brain Hack conference in New York, and the instructor was talking about uh, tools such as Docker, GitHub, Jupyter, Binder, Python, etc. And for this student, this was all new to them. You know, they hadn't come across any of this in their training. And in a sense, the world of research is kind of splitting in two at the moment. I mean, there's the established academics who are basically doing things in ways they've always done them. And then there's a new generation of early career researchers, you know, people like yourselves, who are coming to the world of research uh, with knowledge of all of these great uh, tools that can be used uh, in their research workflows. Um, a few years ago, I would have said that the use of um, you know, open source tools, a uh, focus on reproducibility, a focus on research transparency in research were fairly niche things. But over the last three years or so, I think the world has really changed. And I think part of this change has resulted from uh, the pandemic, actually, or suddenly people realized that, you know, when it comes to um, solving the world's problems, you need to be able to act quickly. You need to be able to make you know, data analysis code software you've developed available to others. Um, I think it was just for Christmas, UNESCO came out with a recommendation on open science covering you know, all aspects of openness and reproducibility, including the use uh, of open source software so that other researchers can use the tools that might have been developed uh, in one area of the world they can be used elsewhere. Uh, and then more locally within the UK, um, at the Cornwall meeting uh, of the G7, uh, they issued a research compact, which really, again, highlighted the need of sharing uh, research data as openly as possible, but also the uh, infrastructure and software behind the data so that other people can you know, uh, use these sorts of tools when emergency, global emergency situations arise. And then specifically uh, within the UK, a few months after that, um, you know, UKRI uh, announced the importance of open research and all uh, funded research within the UK, funded by the research councils. Uh, and Research England, which is part of UKRI, actually put uh, some money on the table, which really highlighted the importance of this. Uh, and they funded the UK Reproducibility Network project um, four and a half million over five years as a way of improving openness, transparency uh, in research. And there was even a House of Commons inquiry talking about the importance of open source software, uh, open data, reproducibility in research and research transparency uh, and everything and everything that we do. So open source is great for many reasons. And one of the key reasons is it allows others to um, highlight areas in your software where things might not work as you uh, intended them to work. So, you know, it's kind of the sort of Linus Torvalds quote, uh, sort of the many eyes can be uh, useful in terms of spotting bugs. And there was a good case um, a few years ago of a Python script that actually worked differently on different operating systems in terms of the way in which uh, uh, data files were read in. And this was, you know, spotted relatively quickly and, uh, and was fixed. So doing things in the open is inherently a good thing because uh, you're, you're increasing the transparency of your research workflow. Um, and really you want to be doing that in such a way that you're not using closed source software, uh, but using, you know, statistical uh, packages such as R and Julia, Octave, which is the open source version of MATLAB and Python, which I'm sure you all know is a much more general purpose programming language 
but thinking about every um, every uh, stage of the uh, of the research uh, you know life cycle, um, and ensuring that your your code works on others' computers as well as it does on yours. And the previous talk we had a great uh, introduction to the importance of when you share your data and code, you need to add a license so that others can use it, but they also know how to reuse it. Uh, there's no point in making your uh, code open uh, if you're not um, giving people clear guidance on how they can use it and reuse it. Um, and when you're developing your software and you're using it, posting it in repositories like GitHub, you also want to make sure that it's citable by others. You're probably wanting to publish it uh, in you know, not a traditional academic journal, but rather uh, one of these developer-friendly journals, which you know, have come about uh, over the last few years is, you know, there's been an increased recognition in the need for uh, researchers to publish their software so that others can use it, uh, also that it's citable uh, and can be improved upon as well. So again, it's the idea that you're building on the work of others and you're letting others build on the work that you've done as well. So making it citable is really important using platforms like Zenodo and Figshare if you're Hosting your software in somewhere like GitHub, you can you can make that citable directly in both of uh, both uh, Vazinodo and Figshare. It's also incredibly important uh, to not take for granted the open source software that others have used. Uh, make sure you always credit those who are by, uh, behind the tools that you use. Um, and rightly or wrongly, in academia, many researchers are actually measured by their citation count. In other words, how uh, how often other people cite the work. So if you've a bit of software that you're using, uh, make sure that you cite it. Hopefully it's gonna have a DOI associated with it uh, that allows you to cite it. And you know, you'd never uh, conduct research without citing the work that you're um, you know, inspired by, that your work is based on. And certainly you wouldn't use somebody else's software without citing it either. And there's a really good SSI guide about how you cite and describe software that's uh, well worth looking at. So just moving into the last bit here, um, this is incredibly important. When we think about you know, making uh, the analysis software that we've written um, available to others, we have to make sure that it's usable as well. And arguably the best way to make your research open, transparent, reusable, is actually to link your code and data together with your computational environment and to share that with others using two fantastic open source tools, Docker and Binder, that you might have come across before. Um, one of my PhD students has just submitted his first uh, fully reproducible paper. All our software we've put on GitHub. Uh, the paper itself is on GitHub, all the analysis, all the data wrangling, uh, everything's there. Um, and we, we submitted this paper, we actually um, uh, wrote a Docker file so that um, it will uh, build uh, and launch a Docker container when you fire it all up. Um, oh dear, that's not a bit more quickly than I was expecting. Um, so basically it means that all our research is transparent, the analysis is available to others. Um, this is obviously sped up, this isn't some mega fast computer I've got. Um, but it means that when you build the Docker uh, container, um, you know, launch, uh, launch the image, you end up with the PDF of the paper um, and you can kind of inspect all the analysis and everything else, so everything is fully transparent. Um, so it's really sort of then thinking about software uh, in, in the context of the entire research life cycle. Uh, great talk uh, by JGLR. I'd recommend you listen to if you want to listen to more about the importance of open source in the context of data science uh, and, and research within uh, an academic context. And uh, thanks very much for listening. I hope that was okay. And I hope I stuck to time because I tend to talk a bit more than uh, I think I do. Thank you. You're on time, Andrew. That was a nice presentation. So there's a question here. How common is citing software becoming? How common um, is software saying? Yeah. Um, oh, so, so, yeah. So how common is software? It's, it's, it's becoming an increasingly common. I think one thing that's really helped within the UK is the role of the Software Sustainability Institute in terms of advocating for the recognition of the critical role in software in just about every uh, research domain you can think of. And I know that um, the SSI team have been very 
uh, engaged with um, you know debates within the UK Parliament. Uh, they fed into various uh, the development of various policy documents, uh, recognizing that software is a, you know a critical um, you know first class citizen uh, in the world in the world of research. And I think over the last few years, in a way that. Um, or the recognition of the importance of openness and reproducibility in research has really gone from being kind of a, almost a hobbyist thing to very much uh, in you know everybody's focus. I think the uh, extent to which software has um, has has cited uh, and is being cited has increased too. And I certainly know that the Journal of Open Source Software has seen a massive increase uh, in the number of uh, submissions over the last few years. Um, I became one of the editors, I think it was last summer, um, and I don't think I was prepared for the number of submissions coming through, um, which just shows what amazing activities are occurring out there. Uh, and those amazing researchers who are writing this great software are, you know, making it available to others, they're making it citable as well. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's increasing massively, and I think it's only going to become, um, it's basically, you know, I think it's going to be mainstream pretty quickly, actually, because I think the last few years have been incredible in terms of the increased focus and the importance of this. Thank you. So we have a uh, few minutes for one question. So if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask one. And in the meantime, maybe I can ask you, what are the markers of a good software? At what time do you decide my software is good for public use? I <laughs> so I guess there's no obviously there's no such thing as perfect software. I think as soon as as soon as it works for you, uh, it's worth letting other people uh, see it. Um, and I'm a great believer in team science. Um, it's one of the SSI's mantras. It's uh, collaborate, don't compete. Um, so uh, if you've got software that works for you. Um, I think letting other people see it and use it and improve it, um, you know, is, is a great thing. I certainly never published any analysis code where I've thought that's perfect. Um, you know, I've got what I would people in Britain would refer to as the Blue Peter approach to writing software, which is having scripts and chunks of code held together by metaphoric bits of sellotape and string, um, but it works most of the time. Awesome, thank you. So there's one final question here. Are the number of new people initiated into open source software keeping up with the number of reviewers available for reproducing modes and packages of your review of the publications? Oh, sorry, I just, I, I got half of that, I'm afraid. Um, so the question is, are the number of people who are coming oh. into open source software keeping up with the number of reviewers oh. available? Um, uh, I think it's, I think uh, there are many, many people just becoming engaged across the board. So I think there are many people, you know, developing software. And luckily, there are also many other people stepping forward and saying, I'm going to play a role too. Um, I may not have software development as the main thing in my doing, I do in my job, but I can help the community by acting as somebody who can assist with reviewing or editing or kind of spreading the word. So it kind of feels as if there's everybody in every um, uh, sort of aspect of uh, the development and use and championing of open source software, uh, they're all increasing in numbers, um, which is good. Awesome, thank you so much. So at this time point, I'd like to give the session to Amy. Amy, you can take over from here. Thanks, Festus, and thank you very much, Andrew, for the talk. And I have just lost my notes, but I believe um, we are next going to talk about agile and iterative project management methods, um, especially in the context of open science projects. Um, I'm not going to talk about it. Renato is because he's an expert in this. So, Renato, over to you. Yeah, hey, everyone. Yeah, I should I should correct that. I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself an expert. I'm possibly an, an experienced person, but not so much an expert. So yeah, to start to start the topic. So first of all, let me share my screen actually. There we go. Can I get just a thumbs up if everyone can see that? Thanks. 
So, so like Emmy said today, I will I will talk about uh, agile and iterative project management methods. Um, I'm I should also say that I'm not certified in any of these uh, techniques or approaches. This is a a big thing in industry. What I'm going to show here today is um, a bit of a simplified form of it and, and how you can use it both for, for open science, for open software development, and, and even for your own research, uh, either as a small team or, or at, a, at a personal level, which is mostly how, how I use it in a, in a rather flexible uh, format. So, so a bit about me, I'm, I'm Renato. I'm currently working in the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg. I'm, I'm also uh, one of two people working on this project uh, called BioIT, where we provide computational support to the, to the local uh, research community in, in various forms, from training to, to direct consulting support, networking, and, and other opportunities. So um, Agile. So what is Agile? So Agile is a bit of a philosophy or, or a collection of method methodologies. It's not really... Um, an approach per se, but there are many implementations of it. The idea, as the name kind of implies, is that you are focusing on um, focusing on uh, speeding up the development and 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 speeding up the process. Uh, I see that there's a, a request for for the link to the slides. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't share this in advance. I will share them once once I finish the talk. So so. The Agile actually, uh, Agile actually started with um, a manifesto. So uh, as I said, this was a, a big thing in, in industry and, and it was and it started to be adopted by, by many companies worldwide uh, with, with different degrees of, of um, structure or, or like um, faithfulness to different approaches. But, but overall, it tried to focus on um, aspects of, of, of speed and, and delivering quicker uh, the, the, the solution either as a product, as a software, or to, um, to customers and so on. So, so to, if we look at the manifesto, we have uh, favoring individuals and interactions over processes and tools, functional or working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. So. In, from all of these, the one that I identify the most with is by far responding to change. And I think this one is the one that we can most easily translate to uh, research, to open science, open software, and, and so on. But if we want to digest this, and, and I should warn that if you start reading into Agile, you will be bombarded with a lot of jargon. The, the people that created these frameworks, they really love to invent words or to just adjust words for different purposes. So um, yeah, a, a word of caution there. But regardless of that, so responding to change and maybe to contrast a little bit with, with the other approaches or, or how where does Agile actually get in the way. So in a more traditional approach, uh, which people call waterfall, you might be familiar with this sort of structure if you have ever written a project proposal or anything of that sort where you need to Kind of define a timeline of events, um, a Gantt chart, or or something that needs to be fully specified from the start. So you might need to have requirements, um, and in your in your uh, software project, you might want to have the design already somewhat implemented, uh, or or con conceptualized. I mean, and then eventually the implementation, the the verification, and the maintenance of the software as the or the project as as the soft as the tool or the software matures over time. And, and so this is fully specified in this, in this sequential form uh, from the beginning. In a, in a more agile mindset, uh, what you do is you try to get to delivering as quickly as possible. And so you start by creating a plan, which doesn't need to be fully specified, but it has actional points, uh, actional item, items, things that you can start working on. And, and in between, you have steps where you collaborate or you develop the, um, the, the software and as quickly as possible, you get to a, de to, to a delivery point, which, as I mentioned, maybe not a fully functional product, but it works, for instance, as a prototype. And then you repeat this cycle multiple times 
until from the prototype you get to, a, to an initial version and then a, a more mature version and so on and so forth. You might, have, you might have seen also in software, for instance, the use of words such as alpha, pre-alpha, um, sorry, if I go by order, pre-alpha, alpha, beta, and, and other Greek letters along the way, these often represent um, maturity stages of, of a software, which can also be encoded, for instance, in, in versions uh, or other forms. So, so to sum it up, Agile is or was originally conceived as a software development methodology, um, but we will see just in a moment how we can actually adapt some of these uh, approaches for for things that are not necessarily software uh, project management. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, it, it favors this iterative approach and, and breaking the work into smaller chunks uh, instead of fix, instead of looking at longer time timelines such as uh, is typical in the in the waterfall method. An example also of waterfall would be if you're writing a grant proposal, you might have um, a project that lasts a few years and so you plan for those three years almost uh, fully in advance. So if you actually want to implement Agile in your project, um, you could go deep down into the framework, kind of look for one approach that, that uh, makes sense for you. And, and by approach, I will explain in a, in a moment what I, what I mean by this. But, but ultimately, if we put all the jargon and all the uh, sort of conceptual structure and, and, and sprints and milestones and all of that, um, a, a little bit on the side, what you can think of is if you, have a, 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 um, if you have a goal that you want to reach, how can you reach it? And if you think, for instance, in a, a, of a staircase, you don't typically start from the ground floor and you immediately jump to the top floor, right? You need to take one tiny step at a time, and perhaps you might have some floors in the middle. So the analogy here could be that um, you will break your project into smaller tasks, and each task would be one step in this staircase. And you could have milestones, which would be a bit of a safe platform halfway through, um, which collects a bunch of tasks together and, and delivers some kind of uh, complete or, or um, prototype of whatever you're developing or, or working on. And, and so the idea is also to break these tasks into tiny chunks, ideally something that you can work on for an hour or two, uh, or at most a day or ideally not more than, than a day because then accountability is also an important aspect of, of Agile. And, and so to give some examples of, of uh, real life projects, so we have, for instance, Intermine, and you can see here one example of um, one implementation of Agile, where here we are focusing on versions. So in each column, you have a different version for, for the software. You can think of them as milestones. And then in, in, inside of each of these columns, you have blocks that represent a task. And then for each of those tasks, there might be even uh, subtasks or um, for instance, like, as you can see here, there's within this blob, there's also seven tasks to be, to be completed. You can also then make these, these um, interfaces very interactive. Um, you can label tasks, you can classify them, you can make them easier to navigate and to find. You can group them, you can assign them to people if you have a, um, more than just one person working on the project. And, and so you can ultimately structure your, your work in, in these um, milestones and tasks and so on, and allows you also to give a good, a good sense of progress as you, as you advance and, and you complete some of the, of the tasks, which is sometimes useful and very rewarding as you see the, the, those boxes getting ticked and those tasks getting completed. Another example that you that you can find is, for instance, um, one that is focused more on a on a Kanban philosophy. So the Kanban is also a um, an an agile approach, uh, but the emphasis is to to have a constant flow of of tasks. And so you typically have uh, three or more categories. You may have a category that is a, a to do category. You may have an in-progress category and a category of things that you have completed already. In the case of, of GitHub, for instance, there's even tools to um, help you automate the transition from one stage to the other as tasks get, um, get completed. For instance, as you see here, when you have um, 
zero or, or five or, or when they, they, they progressively get completed. And, and they automatically migrate from one step to the other. And, and this is, the, it's entirely up to you. And this is why I say that the way that I use Agile is rather flexible because the names of these columns and the names of uh, whatever categories you have are entirely up to you, entirely up to the project and whatever makes sense um, in, in, in your approach. Uh, for instance, I, I also like to have a category of ideas uh, apart from to do things that could potentially be done, but maybe need a bit more maturity or, or they need to um, be th thought out through and, and, and maybe a plan or imp somehow conceptualized to be, to be actionable. And so to give a slightly more concrete example of how you could do this in your in, in a project of your own. So let's imagine that what you have to do is as part of your OLS project, you want to make a website and, and the website could be a, a milestone in your, in your project. And so you would break it down into tasks, which could be, for instance, you want to host it on a domain of its own. And, and so you have one task that would be domain names and potentially subtasks on agreeing what that domain would be, eventually purchasing that domain and, and setting that domain um, on GitHub so that your, your website will be served from it and, and, and you can reach it that way. You could also have another, another bigger task, which would be to actually create the content. Uh, this one would be possibly even a milestone of its own where you have the creation of the content. You could start by writing the project mission and the vision. And this includes something that you could put on the, on the homepage. Uh, you could also write a code of conduct for, for your project and how you want people to interact with your project and to approach you. Uh, you can have an image on, on the homepage. You can have an, an about page with a biography of people involved or, or other aspects of the project. And, and here you could potentially collect biographies from all the members involved. And you can see how each member would then be potentially a, a subtask or a sub subtask, depending how you want to structure this um, on of its own, including collecting names, social handles, emails, and uh, pictures, and so on and so forth. And, and then collecting all of that into, into a single document would be um, a final step. And so to finish on this, I, as I mentioned, Agile is a bit more of a generic approach. There's, you might, if you start reading into Agile, you might find things such as Scrum. I mentioned Kanban, and there's a whole bigger list of um, many more approaches on, on that are considered Agile. And they all, they all have slightly different emphasis or slightly different approaches, um, but, but ultimately focusing on, on getting as quick as possible to the, to the endpoint. Um, there's a, a few additional links on, on interactive, um, iterative interaction design. Link to to Agile glossary as I as I mentioned I'm not a huge fan of the of the jargon that the uh, Agile community developed but there's a big glossary of terms that that you can find not just the words but what they actually mean and some examples of Agile in in academia um, and and if you actually want to get deep down into Agile um, an Agile guide that you can that you can follow through uh, that that takes you in detail to to all the steps perhaps more than you may may need at this point. And with that, I would like to finish and take questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Renato, for this very informative talk. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from folks. Um, first one here on the Etherpad, how to find the best psychological balance between too many updates um, and too few. So too many being things like, you know, pestering or overwhelming clients, collaborators, or the boss. Um, too few, for example, losing the benefits of reassuring them of the progress that has been made, as well as benefiting from their input. Yeah, so I think this is where the more formal structure of uh, perhaps Scrum can help. So Scrum is structured around sprints. So you typically have, um, let's say, Mondays, for instance, you might start by looking at your tasks, deciding what you're going to work through the week, and then you work through those tasks on that week. And then the next week, you will start by evaluating what was actually achieved. Or perhaps on Friday, you would look at what was actually achieved and, and then make a, a tiny report out of that. So I would say that this might be a good way to, to go about it. 
which also scales well with the size of your team. So if you're if you're doing this just for yourself, uh, and if you have a small scale project, it's it's quite a bit of overhead. So so that's why I say that I use it in a very flexible way. But but if as soon as your team starts growing a little bit more and it benefits from this structure, it it's good to have um, fixed uh, times or or fixed moments where you where you can get all the team together, get everyone kind of in the same mindset, discuss what everyone is going to work on, and and then progress from there. And and in terms of yeah, if if you go for a more company style environment, you might have a hierarchy of, um, of of management that someone will actually keep an eye on the project to make sure that the tasks are not completely going out of out of scope or or that suddenly there's not things that are overestimated in, in, in how how much time they will need to to be completed and so on because that's another aspect that I I sometimes find that it's tricky is to estimate how much time something will take and then to actually kind of get exactly that estimate right. I hope I answered the, the question there. Thank you. Um, we've got a second question here as well. Do you think there are some downsides to agile working? Yeah, for sure. So I, I mentioned one already, which is if you have a, a small team, there's quite a bit of overhead, If you, particularly if you try to stick to the whole sprints and, and regular meetings and, and so on. Uh, so that can, can add quite a bit of overhead. Um, in terms of, of other, other disadvantages, the fact that Agile is more of a philosophy, it's not really a methodology. So you, you might find Kanban as a slightly more loose implementation of Agile. Uh, Scrum is way more structured. You have, if you go for fully certified Scrum environments, you have a whole level of titles and, and more jargon that I'm not even familiar with entirely. So so there's definitely a lot there. And, um, and, and you have to think that this is a very enterprise type um, framework. So, so there's a lot of emphasis also on certification and, and structuring the different roles within the framework. And so if, if suddenly you find yourself in a different company that does not follow Scrum, but follows something else, you might struggle a little bit or you might see that uh, whatever certifications you collected on one side uh, will not be applicable immediately and on the other. So, but this depends a lot. But ultimately, I would say that the overhead is perhaps the one, the one point that I would stress as as the biggest obstacle. Everything else looks amazing on 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 on, the, on like theoretical level. Implementation wise, it's full of challenges, but in the theory, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like one of those things you kind of have to try and then and then see it make it work for your own team. Um, I'm gonna take a last one and then um, maybe we should uh, move on, but um, feel free to folks to uh, ask your questions in Slack as well. And uh, Renato, if you're okay with it also, you could have a look at the questions on the Etherpad and maybe put in some answers later. Thank you so yep. much. Yep. So last one here, um, any recommendations uh, or resources uh, for learning or practicing how to do agile project in management uh, insight, sorry, this one's in, already answered. I just saw them. Okay, getting ahead of myself. Next question that we can answer. Um, any resources for these methods when, for when you work with three to four different teams that are distributed and working on different multiple projects? Sounds complex. Yeah, that sounds challenging. Um, so so the, the agile approach scales very well with more teams. The only thing that you will need is then for each team, some kind of hierarchy to have say a project manager there and then someone else that that will coordinate across the projects and, and kind of keep everything going. So you could think of, let's say each team will have, yeah, exactly, <laughs> project manager squared. So you will have, one set of boards for each project, and then you may have one board for all the project managers, where they coordinate a bit of a meta level uh, what what you what you might what might be happening. And again, overhead, but still, you might you might get some gains out of it. Thank you, uh, Laura says. Thanks for the advice. That's great. Yeah, no, it's oh, it's very tricky, um, but. Um, 
yeah, um, great to learn about all these ways that folks have been working with, with Agile and, and in real life situations as well. So thank you so much, Renato, for, for the talk and also for sharing your experience. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're gonna head into a breakout room discussion and um, put some of that theory into practice, as we say. Um, so uh, we're gonna do uh, eight minutes of breakout room. You'll be three to four in a room. Um, so uh, depending on how you've indicated your preference, um, we'll be sorting you into written or spoken discussion rooms. Instructions for the breakout room. For the first three minutes, we'd like you to try and break down your first milestone from your project roadmap into achievable chunks, like um, how Renato has introduced uh, the staircase analogy, for example, think about that. Um, so you can work silently for the first three minutes um, using the note section on the etherpad that's under line 254 at the moment. You'll see there's a note section for each uh, breakout room. Um, so uh, yeah, just you know, think about your first milestone, break it down. Um, if you're in a spoken discussion room, you can also talk about and um, bounce ideas off your group if needed during this process. Um, and then in the last five minutes of the eight minutes, uh, please share what you found interesting and challenging in this process. Um, in the written discussion rooms, uh, please read through what other people have written in the notes and plus one or comments where needed. In spoken discussion rooms, you can take turns to share your ideas about one minute each, we'd say, and um, capture the main insights in your notes. If you need any help, if you are stuck in your breakout rooms, press that ask for help button at the bottom of your screen and we come and sort everyone out. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? I'm going to put the the brief for the instructions into the Zoom chat as well. Sorry, that was very clun clunky, but there's a better formatted version on the etherpad, just in case. Uh, Yo, are we good to go? We are. Um, speakers, you're welcome to join or not join as you like, and the rooms are opening. So I'm going to start now with my presentation. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hong Phuc Dang. Um, so I'm uh, representing Force Asia, and I'm going to talk about the Pocket Science Lab, an open uh, sort hardware project started uh, with the Force Asia community. For those of you, for those of you who have not heard about Force Asia, this is an organization based out of um, Southeast Asia. It was started in Vietnam and then moved over um, the office to Singapore. Uh, the whole idea of Force Asia is to foster open source um, development and education in uh, in Asia. So we, uh, for many years, we've been um, working on open source uh, software. So we release a bunch of open source uh, uh, software from the community. And uh, a few years ago, we started with the, the first uh, ever hardware, hardware project, which is the Pocket Science Lab. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So what is Pocket Science Lab? So uh, as the picture that you see today, so um, a small uh, board, it a uh, multifunctional device is come with an aux oscilloscope, a multimeter logic analyzer, way generator um, and many more you can see here. And there's also uh, um, um, pins uh, that uh, you can connect with different sensors. So the whole idea of this boy is to make a science experiment and to um, help people to learn electronics. As we, as we know, uh, most of uh, uh, like products uh, in our consumer world today make from electronics. And in order to create something, uh, people need to have a basic understanding of electronics. So this subject is being taught in school everywhere um, in Asia. However, very little uh, people have like access to devices that help them to learn um, like uh, electronics. And um, before going into detail, I want to, uh, to start with um, the reason behind this project, why did we start this in the first place? What problem did we try to solve? So um, we at the Force Asia community, we organize uh, the annual Force Asia Summit uh, where we um, bring together developers and contributors from various uh, projects come together, share their knowledge, connect and also uh, work on projects together. And it was, um, I think, I, I believe it was 2010 in uh, Cambodia at that time. 
So uh, Praveen is one of the participants, a teacher, a high school teacher from India. He came to the Vox Asia and met with, with the device. He said that um, he was looking for an open source solution, a, 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 a portable, a small oscilloscope where he can showcase and, and show his students how to, to, to play with different um, uh, uh, function to learn electronics. And he said it's very um, expensive, the oscilloscope and uh, like in school, in India, students really don't have the access to this device. And he come and asked, okay, is there anything available in the open source community that he can use for education purpose? Okay, so, and then from this uh, uh, problem that he's having, we also talked with other teachers at, uh, at the event and we realized that this is, could be an interesting uh, research uh, topic we can look into, like enable students in developing country to have access to, to devices where they can actually learn something um, instead of waiting like the whole week or several weeks in order to get access to the school labs. Mm, and then uh, we uh, we encounter this small device. It, the, the original, the pockets and lab originally started by um, looking around and found this original C laplet. So uh, it was um, this uh, project started uh, with the uh, KitKat um, with uh, KitKat in in two thousand and fourteen. And then based on this, um, uh, we contacted the developer and encouraged her, uh, him to open uh, the hardware to release the the schematics of the the hardware to the community so that uh, people can start to work on it together. And then I think it was a very good decision that we do this. We we was like um, spent time and discussing with him, and finally convinced him to open uh, the device because later on he moved on with his life and does not continue the other project anymore. And the, this uh, origin, uh, original idea continue with with the Force Asia. Um, so from uh, the original version, we um, uh, uh, we transfer it to to the form of the um, uh, Arduino Ono um, uh, a form. The reason why uh, we're thinking of okay, so like you can always like decide the pin in a different uh, form, different format, but we want to make use of the cases that are available in the market. So we always think okay, so what is it that the valuable back in the form that we can reuse the cases out there. And then after uh, that version, we come up with, with another version. Um, um, uh, uh, the reason why we come up with this version, we bring uh, the, the, the other version, this one around to ask people for opinion because we, in the beginning, uh, we didn't have so many people who got, who get experience in, in doing um, uh, uh, hardware. So, so we uh, brought the device around asking for opinions and then people, the experts, in, in the community told us if we if we would mount all the components on one side it will reduce the cost a lot to produce the hardware so this is the next step that we do instead of having it in in, in two side we bring all the components into one side yeah and this is another uh, the, the next version of, of the pocket sign lab um, and this is also the version that stay quite a, a well. Uh, we uh, based on this version, so we um, uh, develop and uh, offer like more support around the board. For instance, um, we um, we have the uh, Bluetooth uh, module, and then we um, also uh, one thing that we did uh, is to print it the the name of um, of the pins on uh, on the back of the device so um, it's easier for, for for the newbies um, to read and, and also to follow this one from this um, uh, from the uh, textbook um, and you can see here and then we also um, add uh, more digital pins that allow us uh, to uh, connect with more sensor. So not only the function that I mentioned in the beginning of uh logic analyzer, but if you want to connect with another external sensor, for instance, to measure um, humidity or to measure temperature. So most of the um, sensor that work with the uh, Arduino also work with the pocket sensor. This is the idea. Uh, and then a little bit about uh, how how to use it. Um, uh, basically, so this is I mentioned earlier in the back we printed uh, the description of the pin to make it easier for more friendly for for, for beginners um, and um, the um, the chips uh, uh, QR code also printed there. 
Um, so basically, in order to use this device, you only need to connect it together with, with your uh, mobile phone. You don't really have to install uh, so much because it's come together with an Android application. So you got the device, you plug it into your um, your phone, and you can use the Android application to, to control the device. But of course, we also have um, the Python library and a desktop app where you can install it directly on your on your computer yeah uh, so this is the interface of the uh, of the, the app uh, we try to replicate what people see on the real um oscilloscope that that you see in in the big device and um yeah so so, so how do you say replicate uh, the real um uh, the real devices Okay, and uh, next I just want to share uh, a few applications. Uh, so what people in the community have been like uh, trying out with the Pocket Science Lab. So they use the, the Pocket Science Lab to um, to create robotic arm. Uh, the user um, can control the uh, four servers of the uh, robotic arms with the Pocket Science Lab. So this is uh, just one of, of the example. Um, and then another thing uh, is uh, the main function in the beginning I said, oscilloscope is actually um, uh, the core function. What we uh, started uh, in the beginning, and um, you can uh, use your micro and the microphone on uh, on uh, on your uh, Android device as the input method for this. And uh, what you see here on the screen is the interface that we that we have on the phone, and it's similar for the Python uh, desktop application. Okay, so this is another few other thing. Yeah, so this is another example how people like what kind of sensor people use uh, to connect with the device. This is only uh, one example, but as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot of other sensor that you use for uh, science experiment. You can also connect with, with the pocket sand lab. Yeah, and recently we, um, we've been uh, uh, like have a very good connection with the bio, by the um, bio, uh, biotech community and we work together with a biologist here in um, in Berlin there is a group um, of biologists actually also connect with uh, the Roche community that the previous speaker mentioned earlier so and uh, we try to connect the pocket sand lab with the uh, spectrometer and this is one um, example that we've been trying out for the past uh, few months um, to, uh, to, re to to do a spectrometer connected with uh, with Pocket Science Lab. And uh, the reference project here, also the Open uh, Spectrometer project, is another um, hardware uh, um, uh, project as well. Um, so one thing, so Pocket Science Lab getting consumer ready. So um, we know that there are a lot of open source hardware projects already out there. Uh, but it's difficult for for us to scale up. So people have the idea. It's not like it's not something um, that really new. So a lot of people want to share idea. A lot of people want to to do open source uh, hardware. But one challenge that we are all facing is difficult to scale up. So after you have uh, the product, how can, can how can you sustain? How you can you continue to produce um, to boot the product? The project into the market so that you can have uh, a financial model to continue the development. There are a lot of big companies out there. How can you compete with them? And uh, the idea of the Pocket Science Lab, we want uh, we want to be an example. We want uh, we try different approach um, to um, to make the BS Lab ready for consumer, so that uh, we want to to tell the world that you can actually make open hardware, you can sustain an open hardware project and it can be uh, used by uh, the worldwide consumers as well. So a few things that, that we did um, to make it ready. So we add uh, the um, SD card um, uh, so that we can store the data directly on, on the device. Um, uh, we, uh, we added a small battery so that uh, when you don't connect with, with the pocket, uh, with the phone, right now we need you, before you need to power the device with your phone. But if you have the battery uh, installed, then you can collect real time data. Yeah, and uh, adding Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth in order to transfer the data easily uh, to, to, to your machine. Um, and um, 
um, again, so one thing that people like it's very small and it have a limited number of pins. So if you try to do to, to, to make different experiments at the same time, there's not enough uh, um, connectors. So we add additional pins as well. And one thing that uh, that really important is um, creating documentation, and this is something I would say as our witness. Yeah, so we have people working on the software, we have people working on the firmware even. So we also have uh, the customized firmware that we have been working on for the Pocket Science Lab. But um, documentation is uh, is tricky, and um, uh, we continue to um, to. Uh, try to do better but 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 still a lot of things need to uh, to be done um, on the documentation side and uh, we hope that by being here connect with uh, with people in, in the um, um, open life side and we we can get like some support and some advice how we can um, uh, push our documentation project um yes just a few i just say a, a, a few more about our latest um development on uh, the android application i think we released uh, the new version just a few weeks ago so um now um uh, the user be able to generate the config files for um uh, instruments and can uh transfer to the bs lab board to log the data automatically so this is something new um, yeah, BS Lab uh, integrated to SIGROG. Uh, this is a summer uh, project from one of our young contributors. So SIGROG is um, the um, uh, signal analysis software suit. Um, it's also an open source uh, project, by the way. And uh, the goal is to um, integrate uh, the pocket and lab in, uh, in SIGROG and it was a uh, contribute. So this project was uh, developed by one of our young contributors from, from India. Um, a little bit about uh, a few lessons that we learned from hardware production. So where do we actually produce the hardware uh, in Sunjan? So um, uh, Vitad is one of the of our contributors. He, he based out of Singapore, but he speaks uh, perfect Chinese. Um, so um, with the help of the community members, we'll be able to connect with the dry producer in China. So you can always like find a producer um, on Alibaba or different platform, but it's really important to have somebody really uh, be there in the place and connect and, and talk with the, the producer as a very it's like you know new project and you also don't produce thousand thousand of device in order to get a good price or a special support for the producer but speaking uh, the language and, and be there in person to meet them it really help us a lot to 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 get this produced so this is something that um, uh, from our team we want to share with anyone who want to uh, who are thinking of producing um, hardware. Um, uh, they always request whenever even a prototype they ask you for a view of material. So you need to to have this ready for um, uh, before you can produce something, and um, for. Uh, like you need to, to know how to compare the prices of different parts. So sometimes um, they sell something called the uh, refurbished uh, component. So you need to check. Um, uh, sometimes one component you can use the refurbished, but some really key component is better to use um, something like manufacturer standard. Yeah. So refurbished. Um, I mean, uh, it's another term. If, manufacturer. So this means that something already have some error or, or people buy and then return to, to the manufacturer. Um, and this is something that uh, we uh, some a few issue um, that uh, during the, the production that occur. So basically, um, it would be nice to have a test case, you know, that uh, you can like uh, automatic test all devices being produced, but at that time, we actually have to test it by, by hand ma manually, one by one device. Um, but what we learned is that it would be more efficient uh, if you already have the auto test. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is about these um, um, female bean headers, not so the stray. So this is just uh, an example, but uh, yeah. So as mentioned before, when we work with the Chinese people, it, um, it's important to speak the language and it's important to understand the holiday time of the producer. But this is already like what happened uh, a few years ago. So currently what we try to do is due to the 
pandemic and also um, the challenge with the global supply chain. So we, what we're trying now is to try to produce locally. So we work together with um, um, the TU Berlin and also uh, Fraunhofer Institute here to, they have facility um, um, on campus where we can produce prototype um, uh, directly um, here in Europe. Uh, we still have uh, our contributor in China who have us uh, to, to purchase uh, the, the components and then we, we ship the components to different locations where we have um, uh, production facility. It's not a huge uh, manufacturer like in China, but um, what we did um, the last few, um, a few years is try to identify uh, fab labs and maker spaces to establish a network where people can uh, locally produce hardware. And uh, this is uh, really important like due to the current uh, pandemic and uh, like supply chain um, uh, supply um, uh, network um, uh, challenge. So we, um, yeah, so, so we try to promote like pro local production and it's only possible when you have open hardware. So where um, uh, it's possible to enable producer any, anywhere can produce themselves uh, without relying on um, manufacturer in, in China. Yeah. So this is the, the next step um, uh, for us. And, and we think that it's so important this day to do open hardware. We see uh, already how many um, uh, story example that people uh, share with us where they do not have the access to um, um, uh, medical um, uh, supply during the pandemic. And uh, it would be much um, uh, more effective and would help a lot of people if we can produce Thing ourselves and in order to produce things locally we need to do open hardware so open hardware is not only about like doing some research enable researcher something for a more small interest group but it's about solving our world problem and i'm really glad that the uh, force asia continue to um to work on on this project yeah, so um, just uh, like like what ha what have happened in the past uh, for the beginning of the project, we we produce and we actually um, the test batch of one thousand ball was uh, like was sold already online and at events, uh, and now we um, continue with our uh, new version. Uh, we have more uh, projects and uh, products in the pipeline. So we also looking into the neural lab and we have um, something like a small like, um, LED batch uh, device where people can control and we do the same, like use the same approach, making it open so people can always pick up and produce themselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, we currently distribute um, the device in these countries. And um, on the right hand side, these are the people who work together with us to um, to bring this uh, pocket and lab forward. So uh, they um, they use the device, they offer this device to in their school. Um, and they also help us to with the production and with um, further development. Yeah. Uh, by the way, um, uh, next week on Thursday is the Force Asia Summit, where uh, our developers will give more updates on the Android and on the Python um, uh, Python application, as well as uh, the latest version of the hardware. So if you have time, I would be very happy uh, to have you um, joining the Force Asia Summit. It's online. Everything will be online. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. That That's such a sort of different talk than Hooli's and sort of, you know, joins pretty well. So thanks so much for sharing this. I noticed that we have Elise Jafsia on call, uh, whose lab is doing quite a lot of open hardware work as well in Africa. Um, thank you folks who stayed around. And if there is any question, please do ask here. Um, hi everyone, I, I have a question if it's okay. Can um, you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you so much, Hong, for the great presentation. I think it was so concise and descriptive of what uh, can be the journey of uh, people who run open, open source projects. So the question I have is uh, for the device that uh, were prototype already, uh, how uh, do we do to have access? Uh, yes, so we, we have the uh, distribution channel uh, where people can just get it online. Your know, people can, uh, can, uh, can purchase the device online. I, I give you the link to do that. Yeah. But we currently sold out. <laughs> so, so the new patch is being produced. Yeah, so we have some issue with um, uh, like at for a few months uh, last year, there's a lack of uh, of chips uh, from China, and it's really difficult to source for for components. Now we have all the components uh, ready. We just need to solder them together. <laughs> yeah, so it should it should be back uh, to the market in a few um, weeks from now. Thank you, Amy, for for sharing the, the website. I was typing and then I forgot. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think for people listening in, it's pslab.io. Um, and then we will also advertise the conference that you just said, which is happening this week. Thanks Thank so much. much. Um, and even though we went over time, it was totally worth it. Thank you so much once again for preparing and sharing this. This is fantastic. And thank you for all your work. It's my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you.